Well, this morning we are going to continue to look at our Advent series that we've entitled The Christmas Story. Are you kidding me? We're acknowledging that to our secular culture, to much of the world, the Christmas story, the supernatural elements of the Christmas story are fantastic. Many people think that they are either mythical or not necessary to the heart and soul of Christianity. Of course, we as a people who believe God's word understand that the supernatural elements, things like the virgin birth, things like the dual nature of Jesus, the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that He fulfilled prophecy, that He was raised from the dead after literally dying. We recognize those as key and vital cornerstones of our Christian faith. Our challenge maybe is not so much to believe them, but to be able to articulate them and have confidence in them. Over the next now two weeks after this week, we're going to be addressing those supernatural elements of the faith. And my encouragement, my hope is that it will encourage those of you who are here who believe, who are certain of these things, that it will encourage you, that it might enable you to be able to communicate them more effectively. For those of you who might be here, who say, I don't believe any of this. My prayer is that you will listen with an open mind, that you will seek truth, that you'll have an open mind to see what truth is. And I'm confident that if you will, with an open mind, seek truth, you will find truth. And ultimately, you'll find that truth is a person, Jesus Christ. For the majority of us here who say, you know, I believe these things, but I struggle sometimes with believing them. I really don't know how to articulate them. My hope is over these four weeks of Advent, you'll be able again to have more confidence in the the truth of Scripture, the supernatural elements of Scripture. Believe them and then, as I said, be able to communicate them and to rest on them and have assurance in them. We're going to be looking this morning at the question of the virgin birth. Last week, we looked at the the question, can we trust the Bible? Can we really believe all these stories? Next week, we're going to be looking at how Jesus fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecies about him and the supernatural element of being able to see that, trust that, and then begin to understand better who Jesus is because of that. And then we're going to wrap up on the fourth week of Advent, talking about the question, was God, was Jesus really God in the flesh? And we want to take time to explore these, even if they're difficult, even if they challenge us, because we believe they're worth believing, because God's word is true. Our foundational verse for this series is 2 Timothy 3.16. And we study these things and talk about these things because we know Scripture matters. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So this morning, let's look at the story of the virgin birth. Perhaps of all of the supernatural elements of the Christmas story, The virgin birth is probably the one least believed, most maligned by critics, or that in liberal Christianity that is most of the time said, oh, of oh, it really doesn't matter if there was a virgin birth or not. It doesn't affect the story. They will say it doesn't affect Christianity. It doesn't affect the gospel. But what we will see is that the virgin birth is a vital necessity of the Christian faith. One might say that you can become a Christian without knowing about the virgin birth, but one cannot be a Christian knowing of the virgin birth and actively rejecting it. It is a vital aspect of who Jesus is. It is a vital aspect of the gospel story. A matter of fact, Donald McLeod in his book, The Person of Christ, writes, I love this. The virgin birth is posted on guard at the door of the mystery of Christmas, and none of us must think of hurrying past it. It stands on the threshold of the New Testament, blatantly supernatural, defying our rationalism, informing us that all that follows belongs to the same order as itself. And that if we find it offensive, there is no point in proceeding further. 
Let's read the story of the virgin birth as told by Matthew in Matthew chapter 1. Turn in your Bibles if you would. This is a familiar story at Christmas time, and it really is the guard, the, the starting point of understanding the gospel in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So this morning, as we talk about the virgin birth, I want to remind you kind of what I mentioned last week. My hope over these four weeks is to just equip you a little bit. We can't by any stretch cover everything in any of these apologetic uh, areas. And so instead of, as I said last week, looking at what we do here on the next, on these four Sundays of Advent as the Christmas meal, we're looking at this, remember, as Costco. We're going by and we're picking samples here, we're picking samples there. It's all food. Matter of fact, in my opinion, it's really good food. But it's just that. It's samples to whet your appetite. We will, over the next few weeks, continue to give you some resources to help you. One of those is that we want everybody to have this booklet entitled The Case for Christmas. If you didn't get one last week, we have plenty still available at the Welcome Center. Please grab these. We bought these for you. Uh, This is a great introduction to some of the things that we're talking about in defending and understanding the supernatural elements of our faith, especially in the Christmas story. Over the next few weeks, we'll put even more resources in your hand. But I want to encourage you, let's take a bite out of what we can know about the virgin birth. And and just like Costco, you might come here and get a, a sample of yogurt, and over there you might get fish and rice. They don't seem to go together, maybe jumping around a little bit. Full disclosure, was my sermon a little bit like that. But what I want to give you again is a sampling of some of the key ways to understand and defend and have a rational faith in this supernatural element of the Christmas story, the virgin birth. So I want to begin with answering the question, why does the virgin birth matter, first of all? Theologically speaking, why does it matter that we hold on to the virgin birth? Why is it the gateway into understanding and believing the gospel? Why do we say that one cannot actively reject the virgin birth and be a genuine believer? Well, I think there are four key reasons why the virgin birth matters, why we must believe it, why it's important and and a cornerstone of Christianity and the gospel. Number one, the virgin birth is important because first and foremost, it does highlight the supernatural. To begin with, the virgin birth highlights the supernatural aspect of Christianity. On one end of Jesus' life, lies the virgin birth, or perhaps better put, the virgin conception. And on the other end of Jesus' life lies the resurrection. And we see in between the virgin conception or virgin birth and the resurrection, time after time where Jesus' divinity, the reality of the supernatural, is highlighted through the person and the work of Jesus. Jesus' authenticity was attested by the supernatural workings of the Father through him. The virgin birth highlights and reminds us that we, while we can rationally believe the evidence for Christianity, it's ultimately faith that drives us. 
And the virgin birth reminds us that we are unashamed of the supernatural elements of our faith. Secondly, the virgin birth matters because it secondly highlights that sinful humanity can't save itself. The virgin birth shows that humanity, you and I, we need redeeming that we can't bring about ourselves. The fact that the human race, that none of us could do anything to produce our own redeemer implies and reminds us that our sin and our guilt is so deep and our inability is so great that we need someone else something above and beyond our natural means. We need a supernatural work of God in us and through us. Third, the virgin birth is important because it highlights God's initiative in our salvation. The virgin birth, if you think about it, is God's initiative on display. Do you realize that God didn't check with Mary if she thought that might be a good plan, he didn't even check to see if she was willing. Do you remember when he announced in Luke chapter 1 to Mary that she would conceive? He said, behold, you will conceive through an angel. He said, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you will call his name Jesus. God acted decisively, gently and lovingly but decisively not asking for permission, but taking the initiative to save us. And then fourth, I would say this, the the virgin birth is so important and it matters because number four, it highlights the dual nature of Jesus. And this is so important. The virgin birth implies and it begins and is the foundation of our understanding that Jesus was not merely a man and that Jesus is not merely God, but that Jesus has two complete natures. He is fully man. He is fully God. He's not 50% man. He's not 50% God, but in a mysterious, divine, supernatural way, Jesus is fully God, able to save, and yet he is fully man. The sacrifice to take our place, to do and to fix what sinful Adam, the human representative of all of us, messed up, that we continue to mess up, that Jesus, the God-man, could come and could be the perfect sacrifice, fully God and fully man. If you don't have a fully divine Jesus and a fully human Jesus, you don't have Christianity. And the virgin birth highlights and reminds us and is the foundation for us to begin to really understand that truth. So that's why the virgin birth matters. That's why we take time to talk about it, to sing about it, proclaim it, and learn to defend it. Now, the challenge is, though, is it is so supernatural, isn't it? I mean, that is quite a story. And that's why people in our culture who actually hear that we might believe this stuff will say things like, are you kidding me? Or liberal Christianities will, Christian, Christians will try to hide it under the rug and say, oh, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't matter, you don't have to take it literally. It's because we live in a time where supposed rationalism has overtaken supernaturalism. And so I wanted to take just a moment to a word about the supernatural. Why in 2018... Must we hang on and believe in the supernatural, in miracles, in God, in things like the virgin birth or things like the resurrection? Well, a common misstatement made by atheists and and those who are critical of Christianity or materialists is this. We don't need God and the supernatural to explain reality. Or we often hear, you hear this in, in pop science on TV shows by uh, lightweight scientists who want to, to uh, be a burr in Christianity's saddle. They say, well, on top of all of that, science has disproven God. But here's the problem with that. 
by definition, the supernatural cannot be proven or disproven by scientific method. Unashamedly, it's reality. Scientific method that we hold on to, that we embrace as Christians, we should love science. We should be those who are exploring the depths of, of the, the human cell and human existence to the vastness of the universe. True science, true discovery is a gift from God. Truth is truth and it's to be embraced. And every time we turn the corner on truth, we see God in a bigger, more majestic way. But to say that somehow science or scientific method can prove or disprove the supernatural goes against the very definition of supernatural. What is scientific method? Scientific method is, by definition, systematic observation. It's measurement. It's experimentation. It's formulation. It's testing and reproducing results and then modifying hypotheses or assumptions. By definition, supernatural means that which is above or outside the realm of the natural. We can no more say that science can disprove God than we can say that science can prove God. Natural means of observation and scientific methodology cannot, by definition, prove or disprove or, quite frankly, give us much insight into the supernatural. Now, what we are talking about is there is an incredible amount of evidence that points towards the existence of God, towards the genuineness of the miraculous. We can look at unexplained departures from natural process in the order of life. We might call those miracles. They're called miracles because no one can quite figure out how to shove and define them into scientific method. We can look at the incredible amount of design in the universe and in uh, the smallest of, of what makes us up as human beings, this incredible amount of design. We can, as we talked about last week and we will talk about next week, we can look at the archaeological, the eyewitness evidence, the historical, and even the logical evidence that would make things like the resurrection or the the miracles that are talked about in Acts chapter 3 and 4 as those things that are reasonable to believe. We would, though, not say that this is ultimate proof that there is God or there is, or there is the, the supernatural. We can say that these things point towards it. We can say that these things make a good argument for it. But we would, again, unapologetically say that ultimately we are a people of faith. That God designed it this way. God certainly in his wisdom could have made the virgin birth observable, repeatable, measurable. He could have done that to any number of things that we take by faith. But he chose not to. Because God in his wisdom understands that there is benefit in walking by faith and not merely by sight. But on the flip side of that, to say that we can disprove God, to say that somehow natural scientific method can disprove what we are claiming unapologetically to be supernatural, to somehow say that science or modern understanding can disprove God or or, uh, the reality of the supernatural is a greater leap of faith than any of us are taking in this room. It's not only like comparing apples to oranges. It's almost like saying, I can prove apples by oranges. It doesn't make sense. They're a different bird in a different category. a matter of fact, Tim Keller, I would suggest this as a resource. So if you write things down, would you write this down? An excellent book called The Reason for God, where he goes into a great many of these arguments for the reasonableness of believing in God and the supernatural. The Reason for God by Tim Keller. He writes this. 
It is one thing to say that science is only equipped to test for natural causes and cannot speak to any others. It is quite another to insist that science proves that no other causes could possibly exist. There would be no experimental model for testing this statement. No supernatural cause for any natural phenomenon is possible. He says there's no experimental model for testing this statement. It is therefore a philosophical presupposition and not a scientific finding. His point is this. When you hear those that come to the table and saying, you can't prove God, therefore he doesn't exist. You can't test him. You can't measure him. You can't observe him with scientific method. His point is to come to the table with that argument is not a scientific argument. It's a philosophical presupposition. It's a statement of faith. Just like we come to the table with a statement of faith. So let's look very quickly then at some of the common criticisms of the virgin birth. Because there are those who will claim, even beyond, oh, it's supernatural, so it's not provable. There are those that do actively seek to undermine your faith and my faith, your children's faith in the virgin birth. And what I want to do is just take two of them. And again, we could talk all day. This is Costco. This is a sample. But there are two, what I would say, most commonly used criticisms of the virgin birth. Now, for some of you, you'll say, oh, this is just not my cup of tea. Just stay awake for the next seven minutes, okay? For some of you, you're keenly interested in this. A matter of fact, some of you are hearing these arguments at school. You're interacting with these arguments in your college classes. If you go online and Google, the virgin birth is ridiculous, you will hear these and see these arguments. And more than this. So what I want to do do is, again, not answer every question, but show you again that the virgin birth, like all the supernatural claims of Scripture, are reasonable and that they, they aren't as ridiculous as critics would say. So here are two of the most common criticisms of the virgin birth. First of all, it's this. The prophecy about the virgin birth in Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, a virgin will be with child. We know that passage well. Many will argue that that actually speaks of a young woman and not a virgin. I just had this conversation this week outside of church with someone. And they brought up and like, I believe in the virgin birth. But, you know, in Isaiah, that passage that you guys always quote, it just means young maiden, that a young maiden or a young woman will be with a child. Well, first of all, before we go into what I'm going to say, um, One of the arguments against that is simply this. Why in the world would that be a significant part of Scripture, even if it wasn't about Jesus, that a young woman will give birth to a baby? Wow, I'm with you. You know, Ben said he didn't want to explain how those things happen. I'm not going to explain either, but that's pretty common. I'm just going there, okay? It's really not all that spectacular. And so we see in Isaiah, in in that prophecy that it's got to be something more than simply saying a young woman will have a baby. Now, this is the argument how it goes. You will hear the critics say, oh, the Hebrew word in Isaiah is Alma, which it is, and not the technical word that could have been used for virgin, which was Bethula. Now, it is true that Alma had a wider, or not grammatical, semantic use, and that it was a broader term than the term Bethula. But there are no clear references in the entire Old Testament where Alma does not mean virgin. In other words, the word that Isaiah used to say a virgin would be with a child could be used in a broader sense in the broader Hebrew language to mean young maiden. However, in the entire rest of the Old Testament, that word Alma is used to talk about a virgin, not Mary the virgin or the 
future mother of God, but in just a general sense in the language. A matter of fact, the word Alma occurs nine times in the Old Testament, and every context where it's clear from how we understand Hebrew, it refers to a virgin. And what's even more important is the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Now stick with me. We're at three and a half minutes for those of you who are falling asleep. What's more important is that the Septuagint that translated the Hebrew into the Greek, into the Old Testament, they used in their translation the Greek word which means specifically virgin. Now, the Jewish translators of the Septuagint would not have used the very clear and precise Greek word for virgin if they had understood Isaiah 7, 14 simply to mean a young woman or a young maiden. And so that argument that some will make, oh, it just means maiden, no, it it just doesn't. We have not only language evidence, but we have historical evidence for that. Now, the second argument that we often hear about the virgin birth is this. Oh, the virgin birth of Jesus. We see that in all kinds of other pagan mythology. And many of you have heard that. Oh, there are virgin birth stories before Jesus' time, after Jesus' time. Christianity just borrowed this pagan myth. Matter of fact, I read this quote this week. It said, Star Wars has a virgin birth. Mithraism has a virgin birth. Christianity has a virgin birth. Big deal. They are all just fables. Now, that's the argument that you will hear. And it sounds really plausible at first glance, but there are a number of problems with it. First of all, the assumption that there was this prototypical God-man who had certain titles, who did certain miracles, who was born of a virgin, who saved his people and then got resurrected is not well-founded. A matter of fact, that picture, that person, that prototype did not exist before Christianity. That that uh, picture of that type of hero in mythology or other religions or, or other stories did not exist before Christianity. There's absolutely no historical evidence. Now, do prototypes or, I shouldn't say prototypes, but do characters like that pop up in history after Christianity? Yeah, they do. They do. But the key is that that prototype of hero that even loosely follows the picture and story of Jesus did not exist before Christianity. Secondly, it would have been unthinkable for a Jewish sect, which is what Christianity was considered, to try to win new converts by adding pagan elements of, to the gospel story. Can you imagine if you were making up a story and you were trying to get other Jewish people to believe in you that you would add what critics say was a pagan element to the story? It just wouldn't have happened. Uh, I suppose a good Jew would have made up a story to fit the Old Testament, but to mix in bits of paganism would have been just the death knell for any Jew considering it. And then the other things that you will interact with are this. The virgin birth, people will say, parallels accounts of other great leaders or mythical or real figures in Christianity. One of them you will hear is that of Alexander the Great. And it's true that as we read some historical documents about Alexander the Great, that there are claims that he was born of a virgin, but we also have historical proof that there was no mention of that in Alexander's biographies until after, again, Christianity. We have those documents dated well after the Christian story of Jesus had circulated. Another one is Dionysus. And like so many of the the pagan parallels, he was born when a god, in, in his case Zeus, disguised himself as a human and impregnated a human princess. But again, this is not the virgin birth, the virgin conception as we read about it in the, Holy, in the scriptures about how the Holy Spirit overcame Mary 
Another might be the, the fable of Mithra. He's a popular parallel. He was born, however, if you read it closely, and it really doesn't take that close a reading, uh, he was actually born of a, a rock, not a, not a virgin. And the cult of, of Mithra in, in, Roman, in the Roman Empire dates, again, after the time of Jesus. And then finally, one that you might interact with is Buddha. And it's said that the Buddha, that the Buddha's mother dreamed that Buddha entered her in the form of a white elephant. But again, this story of the Buddha doesn't exist in any form until five centuries after his death. And she was already married. So what we see here are the parallels and the criticisms uh, just don't stack up when you look at genuine good scholarship. All right, wake up, people. We're getting to the end. So what does this all really matter to us? We talked last week that we can reasonably trust the Scriptures, remember, as being accurate, as being passed on faithfully. We talked about how by any historical measure, we can trust the eyewitness accounts of the early apostles and disciples. We also mentioned the fact that historically we know that these 12 original disciples or followers of Jesus, many of whom penned the the writings in Scripture, that they died instead of recant what they said they saw in the resurrected Jesus and in the supernatural. And we talked about the fact that Uh, Someone, uh, uh, people die for what they believe in all of the time, but no one would die for something they knew was a lie. And we see apostle and disciple after apostle and disciple and early believer die rather than say, okay, I didn't really see him resurrected. I really didn't see these miracles and the supernatural things that my writings claimed that I saw. Every one of them to the person, except for John, died for their eyewitness account of the supernatural aspect of who Jesus was. You add that with what we see, as we talked about this morning, that we, by definition, can't prove or disprove the supernatural. We can see evidence for, but ultimately it is supernatural. And if we can trust the scriptures, if we have enough sense to believe in the supernatural, if we believe, even if you're here and you're just like, you know what, I believe that there is a God. Even if you don't want to call him Jesus, if you say, I see too much in this world, I don't know if I believe in Jesus, but I believe in in something beyond us. If you believe in any aspect of the supernatural, You can begin to believe and trust in what this reliable book tells us about the supernatural and in particular about the virgin birth of Jesus. And so why does it matter to us? Finally, and kind of fourthly to wrap it up, why does the virgin birth really matter to you and to me? Before I get to my two reasons that I mentioned in the devotional book that I hope some of you are are able to read and prepare for each Sunday. Before we even get to those two reasons, I just want to reiterate again that the virgin birth of Jesus is a vital aspect of our faith. It is one of the foundations of Christianity and the gospel. And so it matters because it proves and shows and illustrates and highlights who Jesus is, that he is God in the flesh. That he did take the initiative. He is the only one who can save us. So certainly, foundationally, without the virgin birth, you don't have Christianity. You don't have the gospel. You don't have Jesus. And without Jesus, we have no hope. But if we do really believe in the virgin birth and we embrace it as believers, why does it matter? How does it affect our life? And I just want to give you two reasons as we close this morning. And to me, these are the most powerful and comforting and exciting uh, reasons to believe in and celebrate something like the virgin birth. Number one, 
The virgin birth matters because if we truly believe that Jesus is divine, if we really believe he's God in the flesh, then we can really know that our faith and trust in him will bring us salvation. I don't know about you, but the greatest concern that I have is where will I spend eternity? What happens to me after this life of dust, this brief interaction with the natural world is over? Where am I going to spend eternity? Do I just rot in the ground? Does it just go black? Am I going to go to heaven? Am I going to go to hell? The great truth that the virgin birth points us to is if Jesus really is divine and we really do trust him, we really do believe in him, then he will truly save us. Jesus was the only suitable substitute for our sin. And not only was he a suitable substitute, but he was God and is God and he can and he will save us. And that gives us confidence, that gives us joy. And secondly, not only does it give us confidence and joy about our salvation, but secondly, if the virgin birth is true, we can have faith in all of the supernatural truths and claims of Scripture. So if we're, let me tell you, if we're going to, if we're going to buy the virgin birth, you know what else we can buy? We can buy that God is working all things together for good supernaturally for those who love him, who've been called according to his purposes. That means we can buy and we can believe that when life seems rotten and we struggle and it doesn't seem to make sense or have any reason, we can trust this same God who created, the same God who was born of a virgin, the same God who was resurrected is the same God who is taking the garbage of my life And he's shaping it, molding it, and making it. He's the same God who may take your life that seems very purposeless, and you can believe that he is using your life and purposing it for his glory and ultimately for your good. When the Bible says that there is hope in the midst of pain, even though we can't see it, we know that it's true. We know that the same God who created and was born of a virgin can also supernaturally help us overcome our sin and our struggles. He can heal us. He can empower us. He can strengthen us. He he can encourage us. So why does the virgin birth matter? Virgin birth matters because it is God's gift to us. Not only in the sense that the baby in a manger is God's gift to us, but in the sense that the truth and the supernatural truth behind it is a gift to us. We can trust this God. We can believe him and we can stake our lives to him. As we close this morning, as we sing, I would just encourage you. If you're here this morning and you're going through a struggle, maybe you're going through doubts, would you just call on the name of the Lord and say, God, reveal yourself to me. Show your faithfulness. Encourage me. Maybe you're here and you need to say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Maybe in the areas of the supernatural truth of Scripture, but maybe in the areas of the struggle that you're going through in life. Would you pray, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Strengthen my belief. Maybe you're here this morning. And again, you don't know what you think of all this. Would you take this time as we sing simply to pray, God, reveal yourself to me. And maybe better than that, reveal truth to me. Don't be afraid of it. Maybe you're here this morning and you realize you need to take a step of faith. Maybe it's a step of faith and obedience. Maybe this morning you know you need to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Would you take this time as we sing and at the end of the service while pastors are up front to come, we'd love to visit with you, pray with you, and you can make your commitment, whatever it is to Christ this morning. Whatever it is, would you trust this amazing God that we serve? Father, we pray now as we close our service with a song that you, Lord, would truly reveal yourself, reveal truth to us. Lord, we thank you that you are who you claim to be that we can trust you. Lord, now as we sing, may we trust you even more. And it is in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen.